Mark, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just refresh the browser. All right. Um, let's let's get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Rakmilovic, uh, and I have with me Bala Volanki, part of our product management team. We are going to talk today about uh, the use of blockchain technology in COVID-19 fight, specifically the uh, US HHS project that uh, we were involved with um, uh, using uh, distributed ledger uh, for testing results reporting. Um, I will cover some of the uh, initial uh, uh, requirements and how the project developed and then uh, Bala will uh, talk through some of the technical implementation details as well. So uh, just to begin a little broader though, there has been a lot of work done over the last few years in leveraging enterprise blockchain in healthcare space and you see some examples here of uh, use of blockchain across different use cases uh, within and across the healthcare community. Uh, certainly provide the license and data management credentials, etc. has been probably one of the more popular use cases. Uh, we've done some work in that area as well as electronic health record sharing uh, in Europe in particular, uh, self-sovereign uh, health records uh, sharing across a uh, health system, um, uh, hospital system, uh, traceability of uh, pharmaceuticals and also medical devices, and particularly the anti-counterfeit tracking has been a very persistent theme. And uh, then more recently, of course, uh, particularly with the uh, onset of the pandemic, we've seen a lot of uh, things around public health surveillance, population health management, and so on. And uh, uh, the HHS project, I think, falls within that category, as well as there's been work around claims and fraud prevention in that area as well. Now, in terms of COVID-19 uh, fight specifically, uh, there's actually a blog that I... Uh, wrote recently, you can see it on blogs.oracle.com slash blockchains. It goes in details to some of this, but I'll just summarize quickly. One of the earliest efforts that we've done was uh, working with a partner of ours, uh, Hasera, to uh, provide uh, the blockchain capability uh, for mipasa.org. Uh, so this was uh, a site that was built to collect all of the authoritative data from the World Health Organization and a number of other international and national health authorities to provide it for researchers and analysts to have a verifiable source of data. Uh, blockchain nodes were uh, provided by Oracle, IBM, and Microsoft, uh, basically different hyperledger fabric nodes integrated to work together by Hasera. So this was a heterogeneous uh, multi-cloud network leveraging hyperledger fabric implementations from multiple vendors to underpin, our, basically anchor the data has the data and ensures that when researchers refer to particular data sets uh, in the uh, work, that uh, the data is authoritative and uh, you know fully um, credentials in terms of organization is coming from. There's also been work done uh, on Oracle blockchain with some of our partners around vaccination certifications and test results sharing. Two particular examples are Votun and uh, eLoop. More recently, Wotun in US and Spain, Eloop in Switzerland and France, I believe, created applications to be able to track uh, test result status and vaccination status. We've also worked uh, with Deloitte on a vaccine distribution ledger. Uh, this was a project that initially was launched in the UK and then um, propagated broader from there. Obviously, as uh, you understand the complexity of the vaccine, manufacturing and distribution processes and all of the different participants that are involved in that entire supply chain distribution chain that are value in having a you know, shared ledger environment and Deloitte and Oracle are working on that. Uh, but uh, the project that I wanted to, oh, sorry, this has uh, moved in the wrong direction here, apologize. Okay, here we go. The project that we're going to highlight today is the one that we worked with HHS on uh, this was a project that uh, received a number of awards, including the first place at the HHS at Anywhere Diagnostics Designathon, and more recently from ACT IAC, which is sort of uh, the uh, US Council for Technology and Industry Advisory. Uh, we got an innovation award winner for this deployment of blockchain, uh, which uh, looks to be one of the largest uh, in public sector at the rate at least the data is coming in and the testing ramps up, and um, I'll talk more about this in detail. Uh, this was a project that 
was <coughs> focused on helping HHS collect the data testing results, uh, COVID-19 testing results specifically, from non-lab environments. Uh, so they have uh, existing labs that report the data normally, and they have various mechanisms to do that. Um, what the concern was that as testing expands outside the lab, you know, you go to workplaces or airports at home testing with FDA approving the devices, a lot of new challenges, right? From places that are not used to any reporting requirements, uh, even manufacturing companies that are relatively new to this and don't know how to report the data uh, to HHS, uh, the ad hoc processes, typically file transfer weren't very reliable. There was no tracking. There was issues with uh, human errors uh, and concerns about, you know, data tampering and such, inconsistent treatment of PHI data and so on. So HHS has asked us to come in and help provide a solution based on some of the previous work we've done with them. And they had a set of requirements around security and privacy, confidentiality of the data, immutability, being able to show that the data is not tampered with, integrity of data and identity is maintained throughout. Uh, they wanted a kind of lightweight API interface to make it test and device agnostic, support for standard formats like CSV and natural sevens and ability to report data in real time. So as tests is being performed, the result is being done. Some of those tests are like five minutes, 15 minutes, et cetera, as well as batch reporting as well. Uh, and perhaps the most important requirement was to provide a single source of truth across multiple agencies. So HHS is sharing data with CDC, CDC is sharing it with states and local agencies and so on. And so as uh, a single source of truth was one of the critical requirements for shared and transparent access. And we were able to meet pretty much all of those requirements by deploying this in a highly secured Oracle FedRAMP certified government cloud. Uh, of course, blockchain ledger itself provides immutability and uh, uh, this was based on Oracle blockchain platform using Hyperledger Fabric as its core uh, framework. Uh, integrity of data comes from permission blockchain with ensuring the authenticity of the members who are reporting the data, all those organizations like test manufacturers and venues and so on. And then field level validations as well that was implemented on the front end to ensure that uh, all of the uh, health data that's being reported, you know, maps to uh, valid designations and codes for test results and status and you know, all other kind of things and demographic data. Uh, we created a RESTful API in front of this um, and ensured that this was very lightweight and easy for anybody to integrate. Uh, security for the API was provided through us to token based authorization. Um, the format was at the format definition was at a couple levels. HHS defines the actual payload structure. And then it was delivered in CSV and HL7 formats, HL7 being kind of the healthcare standards for health industry. And most recently, we started working on FHIR formats as well, which is a new standard for healthcare data sharing. And we provided both an API for single test result submission as well as a file upload for batch reporting uh, within this uh, Oracle Cloud infrastructure. So you might ask yourself, you know, uh, why was this based on blockchain technology? What was the drivers for using blockchain technology? So we've started by, first of all, confidentiality being very important, of course, integrity of identity and data and immutability. Those were the three basic drivers. From confidentiality perspective, of course, we start with the FENDRAP data center and all the security that comes with that. Uh, then we have uh, TLS data encryption and then block volume encryption at rest. Uh, ensuring we're using only TLS 1.2 and uh, support all of the kind of standards around that. Uh, of course, there is permission blockchain that uh, authorizes members and then all of the messages coming in, even those encrypted over TLS. Of course, then we check the signatures on the messages. Uh, there is ability to isolate different ledgers in different channels with PHI data and non-PHI data and additional options to do fine-grained access control as well that we provided. The integrity of the data, again, is supported by the uh, private key-based signatures on all of the messages, as well as the fact that there is kind of separation of duties, right, in Hyperledger Fabric between the peer nodes that stores the ledger and runs smart contracts and ordering services which create the blocks. And so you could split uh, the ownership and administrative controls in order to ensure that, you know, no single entity can subvert the data. And endorsement policies on top of that, that uh, can be implemented for multi-signature controls 
if you need to be able to ensure that the transaction update goes in only after it's been endorsed by multiple organizations. And finally, immutability and tamper-proofing comes from, of course, the nature of the ledger itself as cryptographic hashes linking the blocks, and any tampering can be easily detected. However, it can be detected, but it's not detected automatically out of the box in the open source version of Fabric. So we have implemented a verification and auditing tool that sits as part of the platform and is able on demand to provide verification, walk through the blocks, and ensure that all of the hashes still compute properly uh, over the data that's in the ledger. Uh, and this was uh, provided uh, as an add-on capability within that environment. It was actually a session earlier, I believe yesterday, but it's recorded and available from Bahua Young, uh, one of our uh, architects, talking about that particular auditing capability. Uh, and of course, you know, because it's a distributed ledger, we're replicating the data automatically across all of the nodes that belong to different organizations. And we work with HHS and CDC to ensure that they have separate nodes, uh, separate administrative domains, and then there's other things as well that can be done to extend this to other organizations. So we started by deploying Oracle Blockchain Platform, uh, which is Hyperledger Fabric based in the Gov Cloud, uh, using basically all of the FedRAM principles and requirements that the cloud supports. And then this was extended with identity management. Uh, we have a lot of work we've done around high availability, resilience, API gateways, security enhancement, scalability, and so on. Um, initially, we deployed this with three nodes for Abbott, uh, for HHS, and for CDC. Uh, Abbott uh, was collecting the data from the Binex Now test. Uh, HHS approached us in October timeframe. By November, we were in a testing environment and uh, they have the infrastructure running in Azure Cloud. Uh, so through REST APIs connecting to the blockchain node in the Oracle Cloud. Um, and uh, uh, this infrastructure with the first three nodes was live actually uh, by January when they started sending production data. And I think we have today over one and a half million test records. Uh, then we have, of course, shared nodes that are available and uh, for uh, what's called Waters, which is essentially a group of companies uh, sponsored by National Institute of Health's Rapid Advanced Diagnostic Program, RADx program. Um, they are reporting through a front end here that is a shared multi-tenant node. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned, both of them connecting to CDC and HHS, uh, where on HHS side, we're then connecting through a data pump uh, to put data into Oracle database where HHS Protect can access it. And for CDC, we're pushing the data into the report stream uh, infrastructure, which is then distributing to the states. Uh, so this is a node that was built as part of the designer zone effort. We have live reporting coming in from Abbott, Loom, Q, uh, BD, and a number of others. Uh, we've gone through the HHS conditional ATO authorization. So when you deploy something in a government setting, there is this authority to operate requirement, and HHS went through this process with us to get this authority to operate. Um, there is more uh, organizations being onboarded. Uh, there is a number of new test manufacturers coming. And then we're, of course, exploring the fire APIs as well. Um, we've recently implemented extension to CDC uh, for pushing the data into report stream and then exploring also extensions for self-sovereign uh, test status verification and uh, later on for non-COVID disease detection, right? Public health needs that, uh, you know, going to be with us, you know, beyond the pandemic environment. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the technical architecture overview and ask Bala to uh, briefly give us an overview of this uh, from a technical architecture perspective. Thanks, Mark. Um, hi. Uh, the technical architecture mainly consists of um, with multiple clouds and multiple components here. Let's start with the top, the first one on the screen which shows by next now i think by next now is a test kit that has been supplied by uh, abbott and uh, abbott uses azure cloud to rest rest calls to submit their data result data uh, that that is get that is got that they get from patients and it is submitted to our api gateway which is uh, running on our oci or oracle cloud infrastructure which is fed rank fed RAM certified so as soon as we uh, receive the results from their uh, results from uh, Binax now or Abbott, 
what we do is we just go and use our Oracle Access Manager to go and get it validated with the user user privileges that are assigned to the Abbott users, and then we we store it on the blockchain nodes. And as once the results are submitted, they are sent to multiple parties that are there in this. And one is HHS, the other one is CDC Gov node, which you see on the right hand side top boxes where. One is fed into the Palantir system using using our rich history feature where we capture all the data that is sent to blockchain and we build analytics on top of it and also provide the data to the CDC stream, which is a node on the blockchain. So there are three. Uh, as you look at this, the circle in the center talks about how many nodes are there. For now, we have four of them. One is the Abbott Lab that's up, um, that's up, that gives the, the patient results to supplies the patient results to the ground node. HHS government node and CDC. Right now, we also have Waters uh, going through. Waters is one of the product that um, the government uh, results are supplied for from each of the states. You can see a few of the customers who are already submitting it, and the data is received by the states here. The key purpose of this functional architecture is it can be extended to any any size, and it is on the government cloud, which is where RAM certified, and we use all the enterprise blockchain grade facilities that are there provided by Oracle blockchain using multiple channels. Um, and the, uh, all the access control which you're seeing inside the authorizer for, for using authorizer and OAuth 2 are done, done through Oracle Access Control Manager in this case. There are flexible API model formats that we support like CSV, HL7, and FHIR. And you can scale it to the needs of the customer whenever it needs. There was a question in the chat saying that how much transaction support do we support? We we tested and we went through with Abbott for millions of transactions, and uh, uh, it can be extended based on the need, though, based on the nodes that are there on the blockchain. So Mark, you can go to the next one. Now, uh, I'll I'll give you one uh, one representation of a blockchain platform, what we support and what we differentiate from others. Uh, the key thing is uh, Oracle blockchain platform. What what we uh, show as a key feature is the integration with all the Hyperledger third-party clouds that are there. If you have Hyperledger or any third-party cloud, we support integration with that. And we also have one more word, uh, other on-prem version that can be deployed on your infrastructure uh, using the Oracle Enterprise Edition. Those. Things are very tough for any of the very easy for all the partners who are there on the network to communicate. They they can be on Oracle Cloud, they can be on other Hyperledger fabric, and they can have the other Hyperledger fabric nodes on other clouds too. Now, the key parts are plug and play integrations. We support integrations with all the ERPs and SAP ERP or, or Oracle Fusion ERP and other databases that we have. We have all the built-in adapters. That are that are available on the Oracle Integration Cloud that can be integrated to blockchain. So not only that, we have lots of third-party apps that can connect using our Oracle Integration Cloud and the SaaS applications that we also deploy on Oracle Blockchain Platform. Um, in, in in any case, uh, all the integration capabilities provided by the platform are are built in, and uh, that's the key uh, key. That's a key advantage of having the Oracle blockchain platform, and it can be scaled to the level of the customer's need. Uh, Mark, you can go to the next slide. So here we can see the major value that we add on top of uh, Hyperledger uh, fabric that we have. This is ma mainly starting with provisioning and integration. We provide an easy console and pre-assembled version of how to provision, and we provide blueprints to do that. And we can integrate with uh, any of the clouds or any of the vendors that you have on your um, uh, in, in your enterprise and we offer a managed service and also an enterprise edition which is an on-prem service too in this case on-prem edition too in this case we offer on and we also do idm integration uh, internally which is all the yeah, which is all plugged and played with uh, our oracle integration so or oracle idm integration and control and auditing basically a lot of uh, customers are looking for fine grain access control basically looking from the from the smart contracts perspective to just go and uh, do auditing uh, giving access to the data that has been sent to the blockchain using the fine grain access control we provided a good feature for that way you can control those there's a lot of even the uh, the even subscription one is one of the key api uh, APIs that we provide for uh, subscribing to uh, the events that have been published on the blockchain when a transaction happens. 
So there's a rich feature set of uh, like around good set of APIs that you can use to capture the events, track the events or anything. Now, going on to the final consideration, we key considerations we have uh, con uh, conditional authority to operate. We did multiple changes on our on, on in this implementation. One is outside the normal blockchain mechanisms, which is we we did lot, took a lot of cloud security measures to get it into the OCI FedRAM certified OCI using the government cloud security measures, and also we did we are going to do we we are having the data encrypted at the uh, in uh, data encrypted on the internal side of it using the TLS and using the block volume encryption with AES fifty six. There are a lot of protective measures we took insert internally using the normal blockchain mechanisms like permission, network membership, and policy-based actors, REST APIs, which are tied to the IDMs and directory services, and the APIs that are managed via TLS uh, encrypted messages, and the fine grain access control, which I talked to. So I think these are the key advantages that of using this, and we implemented all those. So, and finally, uh, going on to uh, that's fine, Mark. You can we can go to the next one. So there are lots of uh, material and blogs that are written. If you can, this presentation will be shared to you guys in case you you are having any questions, you can just look at these uh, uh, the deck and uh, look at the links that are provided in here for any of the uh, blockchain platform questions. And also there's a developer site ebook that was written, and there's a YouTube channel too which you want to watch and. Uh, Come back to us if you have any questions you can reach out me or mark anytime um by uh, just clicking on uh, just clicking on the developer site thank you all right thanks everybody thanks Bal. i appreciate it uh, as Bal said there is a lot of information you can uh, follow up on uh there, here's a link to the blog post specifically that talks about the use of blockchain in covid 19 fight uh there is a great range of different solutions we just highlighted one of them for HHS, uh, but uh, the blog post actually goes into details on a number of other uh, COVID-19 related uh, blockchain implementations. Uh, and with that, uh, we can take uh, a few more questions. Um, so feel free, go to the Q&A panel, uh, Q&A tab on the right, and uh, there have been a few questions asked um, that uh, we've answered there, but uh, I'll read them out as well. Uh, there was a question about uh, the transaction volumes. So we've done initial benchmarking at over 50 transactions per second on this infrastructure. Of course, it can be easily scaled in the cloud environment. Um, the expectation is that some of the test vendors uh, will be doing millions of tests a day, uh, concentrated often in morning hours, let's say, you know, 9 a.m. or 8 a.m., whether it's you know kids coming up to coming into school or employers or you know other kind of uh, time-based uh, test environments, right? And then of course you know broader testing across uh, sports venues and what else uh, might be coming up. Uh, the expectation is that that will continue, and so we'll continue to see more testing going on and will scale as necessary. Uh, we have uh, at this point over one and a half million test results that's been collected and then obviously you know shared with hs protect with cdc uh, report stream for the states when necessary and so on um, so the system is in production since january and is expanding uh, feel free to ask any other questions again using the q a panel q a tab and uh, as Bal mentioned, the presentation is shared. If you go to the schedule and you click on the presentation, there is a PDF there that you can download as well. Uh, if you want to go. Any particular challenges cloud? So. Oh yeah, uh, sure. I mean, government cloud is uh, uh, is an interesting uh, place to operate. I mean, it's much more restrictive than what we typically see in commercial cloud environment. So, uh, you know, in terms of access security, multi-factor authentication, uh, there is a, um, a lot of scanning that goes on beyond what you typically would see in a commercial cloud. And uh, in order to get the authority to operate for a government agency, 
uh, they have to go through quite a bit of work uh, that requires documentation, uh, penetration testing. That was one of the things we had to do actually specifically for this uh, full-on penetration testing. Um, and, uh, you know, we passed that as well. Uh, so um, uh, there is a lot of steps involved in getting this authority to operate. But the good thing is that once you get it, then within that particular government agency, uh, there is many other, uh, you know, potential uh, deployment opportunities that can all refer to the same authority to operate. And even in a different agency, uh, you know, say so that, you know, this has been done with HHS, but there is conversations with some other agencies now. Um, they can refer to that authority to operate when they are requesting their own. So they still have to go through their process, but that process is much simpler and faster if they can rely on, uh, you know, uh, another agency having undergone that process, because a lot of the requirements are very similar in terms yeah. of, you know, penetration testing and security standards and all of that. Mark, one more question, and it's more related to blockchain or the central database. Why blockchain was as a central database since everything is so controlled, government, environment, and uh, security, access security, etc. Sure. Well, you know, you, you would think it's controlled, but, but government is not a single organization, right? Uh, at least in the US, it's not. Uh, you have uh, all of the government agencies, and even within sort of CDCs and HHS, but really operates independently. So HHS and CDC, and then you have some other smaller agencies, uh, they all want independent control of the data. And then you have states, right, which all have their own health departments and health agencies. And then you have some non-state actors, like some of the, you know, um, territories and Indian governments and so on that are sort of separate jurisdictions within the US. Um, and then you have the companies that are reporting the data as well. Um, and so uh, the desire to use blockchain for immutability, uh, for data integrity and transparency across all of those organizations, right? Single source of truth. Um, nobody wanted to say, yeah, we're going to rely on that one database and there is this one agency responsible for the database. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it's much more complex in the government environment when you have so many different agencies at both federal level and non-federal. And the share, part of sharing, actually, and giving control to the access is the key one, which is which is powerful with the blockchain technology itself. So, yeah. All right. Any other final questions before we wrap up here? We are at uh, the bottom of the ten, ten, ten. I think that's our close to our end yeah. time. Uh, feel free to follow up. Uh, you can easily find me and Bala on LinkedIn. Uh, or just send an email is basically first name that last name at oracle.com and uh, you know happy to answer any you know other questions you might have after you have a chance to download the presentation thank you